So this past Thursday was the 75th anniversary of D-Day. That is June 6, 1944. It was the day that the United States and Allied forces landed in Normandy to begin the Western counteroffensive against Hitler's Nazi Germany. Now, before we go any farther, I have, I have three questions I want to ask. Number one, do we have any D-Day veterans here in this room right now? I don't know if we do. Unfortunately, that generation is, is passing from us. How about, do we have any World War II veterans here, here now? A few, yes, sir. Would you please stand? Any other World War II veterans, please? Now let me ask one more question. How many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you all have known either a D-Day or a World War II veteran? Yeah, everybody in here. I think that is an extraordinary thing. We don't, we don't always appreciate that because, because as that generation passes, um, there are gonna be fewer and fewer people who can affirmatively answer that question. But on D-Day, 156,000 Allied soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines did their duty by hitting the beaches and by dropping from the sky to set Europe and the entire world free from the existential threat of Nazi domination. And I, over my career as a pastor, I have been privileged to know several of those men, D-Day veterans, and one of whom was a guy named Del Delray Harrington. He served in World War II in the 101st Airborne Division, and his service record reads like a novel. It reads almost like a movie script. I mean, this is a guy who flew a glider into D-Day. He was one of those 101st Airborne glider pilots. Only one in three gliders made it down safely. Then he was part of the invasion of the Netherlands. He was part of the Battle of the Bulge. And then he was one of the few guys who was actually at the Eagle's Nest, that is Hitler's secret mountain retreat when that was captured. I mean, this guy's life, his, career, his war record, reads like a storybook. And, but you know what, it's not just Delray. You can't read the stories of those, of those soldiers, those sailors, those airmen, without wondering, how could they do that? I mean, I think about them on the landing crafts. I think about them in the, in the gliders. How could they do that? What gave them that courage, both on the battlefield and those who were at home, who were praying for them, who were supporting them through their work and through their love? How could they do that in Europe and in Asia? How did they do what they did? And how could they give what they gave? It's an impressive group of people. And another ingressive, uh, uh, impressive group of people that I think about were the early Christians. Paul and the early Christians gave their lives for one another. They loved one another. They suffered for one another. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle said that he personally was tested by whips and iron and stoning and hunger and slander and shipwreck and sleepless nights by anxiety, by snake bites, by poverty, by prisons, by persecution. He says at one point, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. When I think about them, like the D-Day veterans, I think, how did they do it? Those first followers of Jesus, the apostles and the, and the martyrs, those early Christians who gave their lives to tell the truth, to tell the world about God. How could they face what they faced? What gave them courage, both on the streets and in the prisons, in the cities and in the small villages, in Jerusalem, in Corinth, in Antioch, in Ephesus, even Rome itself? What gave them the courage to do what they did and give what they gave? I mean, where did those ordinary men and women get their courage and the power to do what God sent them to do? And then I think even one step farther behind them, what about Jesus himself? 
This is the man who lived in poverty, left, a, left a, an ordinary life, who, who went out, lived in poverty, taught, faced ridicule, and then finally faced humiliation, pain, torture, and finally execution in the most horrible manner possible, all to tell the truth of God. How did Jesus do it? You know, what gave him the courage to follow through with the Father's plan? And the answer, I believe, is this. It's not a what question. It's not what gave them the courage. It's a who question. They were able, the first Christians were able to follow the example of Christ, and Jesus Christ was able to do what he did because of the Holy Spirit of God. Paul and the first Christians were empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And it's important on this day of Pentecost that we connect our lives and the mission upon which God has sent us, the, the mission of the early church, and even the mission of Jesus together. Because there is a theme running through all of them, and it is the theme, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that we celebrate today here at Pentecost. Now before Jesus returned to his heavenly Father, Jesus gave his people both a promise and a mission. When he ascended to the Father, he said this, listen to this, this is chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts. You will receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did you hear that? Jesus said that he was going to send the Holy Spirit, that God was going to send the Holy Spirit and he was going to send them out into the world. Jesus renewed his promise that God was not going to abandon them when he left. And that God was going to send his Holy Spirit to lead them and to empower them so that they could continue the ministry of Jesus himself. They had both a promise and a mission. And that promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Now, historically speaking, Pentecost means literally 50th day. And it was... A, a sort of Jewish agricultural festival that took place 50 days after Passover. For generations, it stood as a kind of Jewish world's fair. It became a big reunion weekend that attracted Jews from all over the Roman Empire, from as far away as Arabia and Persia and Egypt and Iraq. They all gathered in Jerusalem for this world's fair. But this year, something strange happened. In 33 AD, on that Pentecost day, we read that all of Jesus' disciples were gathered in Jerusalem, that they were gathered together. Turn to page 1081 in your pew Bible, to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Here's what Luke writes. Luke writes this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amidst the changing words of our generation, speak to us your eternal word that does not change. O oh, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For it is in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. On that day, the day of Pentecost in 33 AD, God delivered on his promise of the Holy Spirit. And he delivered on that promise so that we can fulfill our mission to deliver the love and truth 
of Jesus Christ to the world. So what happened on that day? On that day, God gave to us what was in Jesus. God gave to us what was in Christ. Now to understand this, we need to understand the connection between the Holy Spirit and the person and the work of Jesus Christ and how that connects to the work of the church. So to do this, let's look at three important episodes from the life of Jesus. How does the Holy Spirit empower the ministry of Jesus? Well, it all begins, where would you think? With the Christmas story, with the birth of God, with the birth of Jesus, when God became man. Jesus was God's own supernatural and biological son. The angel told Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God was born as real flesh and blood, mortal human being. And the Bible labors to make the point that Jesus was fully God and yet was also fully man. John says that in the beginning, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he was the Son of God, but he was an authentic human. And the Apostle Paul wrote that even though he was God, he left all of that power at home and came to earth with nothing. He took all of the limitations of human beings upon himself. Jesus was unique in so many ways, but when it came down to his humanity, he was an ordinary guy. No more superpowered or superhuman or supernatural than us. And so, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus gained a unique life to be fully God and fully man. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus had a unique identity. The second episode is the baptism of Jesus. Now we might ask, why was Jesus baptized? Why did he need to be baptized? He had no sin to wash away. He did not need to repent because he was already 100% committed and enthusiastically surrendered to God. John the Baptist, his cousin, even tried to stop him from being baptized, saying, you know what, I'm the one that needs to be baptized, not you. And I can tell you, I don't have a single cousin who would say that about me. <laughs> so why was Jesus baptized? Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, and with him I am well pleased. Even though there was never a time when Jesus was separated from the Holy Spirit, this story shows us the point when the human life of Jesus was empowered by God. This was his personal Pentecost. And in that moment, God embraced his fully human, ordinary son, saying, this is my beloved son, and empowered him forever for the extraordinary mission and ministry that he was sent to fulfill. Even though he was co-eternal with the Father, even though he was the Son of God, the fully human Jesus was baptized to show us how God, through the Holy Spirit, empowers ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Third, Luke tells us that at the very beginning of his ministry, shortly after his baptism, Jesus preached in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. And he got up and he took the place of, of the teacher and he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And this is what he read. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What was he saying? He was saying, what you just heard, what Isaiah wrote, he was talking about me. Now here Jesus had just claimed the prophecy of Isaiah, the promise of God as his own personal mission statement. That was outrageous. That was blasphemous. The people were confused. And they said, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary's son? Who does this guy think he is? But Jesus was saying, you think that I am just a carpenter's son. But God has empowered me to deliver the promises of God. God had promised these things through the prophet Isaiah, and he was going to fulfill them in Jesus. And notice where it all begins. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God not only claimed and empowered Jesus by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit also gave him a mission to deliver the promises of God. So the Spirit gave Jesus life, the Spirit gave him power, and the Spirit gave him his mission. And three years later, the risen Christ stood before his awestruck disciples and he said, Now, you, you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. You, fishermen, you, tax collectors and farmers, you, peasants, you, former prostitutes, you, shepherds and scholars, you, faithful but ordinary human people. God has power and a mission for you. You will receive the same presence, the same promise, the same power that has been with me this whole time so that you can deliver the promises of God to the world. God was going to empower his adopted children by the Holy Spirit just as he had empowered his own supernatural and biological son. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and catch this, and greater works than these he will do. And on Pentecost, the same God that kept his promise to raise Jesus from the dead, fulfilled his promise to send them the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And from the day of Pentecost on, the followers of Jesus started doing the things that Jesus did. From Pentecost on, they were changed people. They stopped hiding and started boldly proclaiming the gospel in public in spite of beating and imprisonment and torture and banishment and even death. God gave them supernatural courage and they just kept coming back for more. God never abandoned them. And even when they were trapped in prison, Paul and his friends proclaimed the gospel to their jailers. They healed the sick. They raised the dead. They spoke in tongues. They cast out demons. They traveled farther than most people of their age would have ever considered. They spread the gospel from Spain to India. And the Spirit told them where to go. He told them where not to go. He told them what to do and what to say. And most of all, people like Matthew, Mark, 
Luke, John, Peter, Paul, Jude, and James not only taught God's Word, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they wrote it down so that the truth of God would never be lost. The early Christians not only followed the model of Christ, they were empowered by the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. On that first Pentecost, God delivered his promise of the Holy Spirit so that his people could deliver his promises to the world. And today, as we celebrate the day of Pentecost, we remember that God's Holy Spirit still empowers his people to deliver God's promises to the world. God's, God sent Jesus to set people free and the promise of God is freedom in Jesus Christ. And that is the message that we are called to proclaim to all people all over the world. Because the Pentecost promise is the promise of freedom. Freedom from blind ignorance and the lies that God isn't real or that God doesn't matter or that he hates us or that he doesn't care. Freedom from sin and condemnation. He takes all of the pain that we've ever caused or wounds that, wounds that we've ever inflicted. He takes our shameful perversions. He takes every infidelity, every lie, every broken relationship, every public offense and embarrassing secret, every word spoken in anger or arrogance, every debt left unpaid, and every corrosive attitude that pushes us away from God and other people. And he says, you are forgiven in Christ Jesus. He gives us freedom from conformity to the world's values and says, you know what? You can be different because you are a child of God. You have a choice. You don't have to go along with the crowd or the culture or the world. He gave us freedom from legalism and all forms of religion that tell us that we must prove ourselves worthy of God's love, leaving us with a crushing sense of failure that we'll never be good enough for God to love us. Jesus came to show us that our salvation is not based on what we do, but on what he has done for us by his life and death and resurrection. It's freedom from fear, anchored in the sovereignty of God and armed with faith in the living, grave-defying Savior. Jesus frees us from the fear of death and releases courage into our lives, and it frees us to take risks and to follow Christ as his early church did because Jesus frees our hearts to love without counting the cost. He frees us from feeling like we always have to be right or from the arrogance that we must always win or that we cannot suffer insults. He frees us to say, I'm sorry. He frees us to turn the other cheek or to forgive even when forgiveness is not asked. He frees us to serve people Homeless, helpless, refugees, even those we might consider worthless or even beyond hope. And to do it all without worrying about what other people might think. Jesus Christ sets us free to dream with hope, to love without fear, to stand with holiness, and to live in courage. Delray Harrington and the people we remember this week were ordinary people who did extraordinary things to keep the promise of freedom alive. On Pentecost, God gave his Holy Spirit to the followers of Jesus so that ordinary people like us could do extraordinary things to deliver God's promise of freedom in Christ to the world. He gave them the illumination, the inspiration, the confidence, the boldness, the conviction, and the power and the purpose that they needed. The day is surely coming, if it has not already come, that ordinary people will need D-Day courage. And ordinary, everyday Christians will need both the example of Jesus Christ and the power of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to carry out God's mission. That day is coming when we will need that who 
Because the answer is not a what, it's a who. Not what will give us the courage, but who will give us the courage. When we read the stories of the early Christians, we often think those stories are wonderful and inspirational, but they seem too good to be true. I can never do that. How can people do that? And the answer is that they didn't do it alone. The promises of God, the mission of God, even the truth of God are all too big for us to carry on our own. We don't have the courage, we don't have the strength, we don't have the skill or the will or the perseverance. We don't even have the desire to do it on our own. And so God sent the Holy Spirit to give us, ordinary people, the power to do extraordinary things for Jesus Christ to give our lives, to deliver the promise of Jesus to a world that needs to be free. Can you pray with me? Oh God, our Father, on this Pentecost day, we, we feel like ordinary people. We feel like people who are perhaps outmatched at times and out out-resourced, we feel overwhelmed by the challenges in front of us, and yet you've given us a simple mission to spread the truth of Jesus Christ, to, shed, to tell people about the freedom of Jesus Christ, and to do it with everything we've got. Lord, help us to have not just D-Day courage, but Pentecost courage, knowing that we can't do this on our own, but that we can only do these things by the power of your Holy Spirit. Awaken that spirit in us. It's already here. It's already in your church. Revive us, O oh God, and lead us to a world that needs to hear of your freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.